Hello everybody, my name is Matt and here we're going to be talking about occlusion, myocardial infarctions. So we won't go too much in depth with this, but some of this is important when it comes to understanding the ischemic effects and ECG changes. So let's get to the basics. The normal resting potential is approximately one, negative 160 to negative 190 millivolts that is caused by sodium potassium pump. This pump creates an electrolyte gradient with potassium in the cells and the sodium outside of the cells. First, the sodium ions rush into the myocytes until the membrane potential hits around two, about 20 millivolts, and this causes depolarization, and once the action potential hits 20, the sodium channels close. Depolarization is depicted by the QRS on the 12 lead. The next phase involves the potassium and calcium. Remember, potassium is still inside of the cell with all the sodium ions right now. In the next phase, the potassium rushes out of the myocytes and the calcium starts to enter them. Since both of them are positively charged, there's very little change in the active potential, which you can see on the plateau for phase two over here. After phase two, the calcium channels close and the sodium potassium channels remain open and the potassium ions slowly leak out. Because they are positively charged, the membrane potential will decrease into the negative millivolts, and you can see that in phase three of the cardiac action potential, which is called repolarization. A normal and healthy cell repolarization begins at the same point that depolarization happens. This continues until the resting membrane hits negative 90 millivolts. It then waits to start the whole cycle again. So now that we know the basics of cardiomyocyte action potential, Let's get into what caused the ischemia effects on the 12 lead. Now we all know injured cells do not act the same way as healthy cells, right? So why would damaged myocytes be any different? When myocytes are damaged, there's a cascade of events that cause EKG changes. One of these events deals with the electrical changes due to the decreased amount of sodium and potassium pump activity. This causes a decrease in diastolic transmembrane potential, which in turn delays phase three repolarization. As I said in the previous slide, the repolarization in healthy cells occurs at the same spot as depolarization. This is the ops for ischemic cells. The repolarization will occur at the opposite site from where depolarization occurred. Now, I think that's enough patho for today. Now let's get into the main part of the lecture. In the graphic below, you can see a normal progression of a common STEMI. Not all infarctions are like this. In school, you're taught about two real types of myocardial infarctions. One's gonna be your STEMI, which is one you can see on a 12 lead, and the other is a non-STEMI, which has no EKG changes and can only be determined by measuring your troponin. Now, what if I told you there's actually a third type? The third type is called an occlusion MI, or a subtle STEMI. This is the middle ground between the two most commonly known ones. An occlusion MI will have subtle EKG changes and will not meet STEMI criteria. Most hospital physicians do not recognize these, and when a patient sits in the ER bed for hours and infarcting, the second troponin that they do will come back positive and then they'll rush to the cath lab. Time is organs, people. So the faster we can diagnose these, the faster we can get them to the cath lab and save their ejection fraction. Now in one study, an occlusion MI happens in about 18% of patients. That's pretty high, right? The first step in this flowchart is hyperacute T waves. So let's recognize them early. Now for reperfusion, we need to keep in mind about reperfusion accelerated idioventricular rhythms. We'll hit on reperfusion AIVR on a separate video. Now before we get into an occlusion MI, we need to hit on STEMIs to make sure we're competent in diagnosing them. So I'm gonna show you some several STEMIs that are so obvious that even an Uber driver can spot them. Okay, time for some STEMIs. Pretty simple, right? Well, like I said, these are so simple, anyone can notice them. It's like having a patient with an amputated extremity and saying, hey guys, I, it's amputated. Well, obviously. So we can't really pat ourselves on the back for recognizing these ones. So let's get into some real electrophysiology. For signs of an occlusion MI, here we need to look at and remember some key things to look at on a 12 lead for recognizing this. The T waves are supposed to be upright in all leads except for AVR and sometimes V1. Inversion and AVL can indicate an inferior MI. AVL's best friend is lead three and vice versa. These are the most reciprocal leads to each other. The T waves also should be asymmetric in nature. If the T wave starts looking sym symmetric, think cardiac ischemia. The T wave will develop a 
wider base and become quote unquote fatter and become more symmetric in nature. The next thing to remember is proportionality. You shouldn't be able to fit a whole QRS complex in the T-Wave. Yes, those are dogs. Yes, we love dogs. Everybody loves dogs. So you get dogs to show proportionality. And before we go on to the next slide, I love showing this to students. If you can follow this with your finger, it curves upwards and it's very asymmetric slow up slope and a quick down slope it's going to be your asymmetric in nature it's your happy face that's going to be your concave t waves convex obviously if you do this and you if you follow it from here at the j point out it shoots right off the qrs complex and gives you this dome effect it's a slow up and slow down t wave this is your convex morphology it's your frowny face you should be really sad when you see this. Now let's get into occlusion MI identification with some cases. Now we're gonna talk about occlusion MIs for the next couple slides. This is a 30 year old male complaining of substernal chest pain. What do you guys notice? Direct your eyes over to the inferior leads. So two, three in AVF. See that T wave inversion and a little bit of depression? Well, lead three's best friend and most reciprocal lead is AVL. So let's look over here at AVL. See that small QRS and that massive T wave? Well, the first rule we need to remember is proportionality of a QRS to T wave. See how massive that is? Very small QRS, massive looking T wave. That is a hyper acute T wave. Now, on to the next. Here's a 12 lead of a 41 year old female complaining of some burning epigastric pain. What do you guys see? Notice the slight depression in AVL over here. Look at AVL's best friend, which is, like I said before, lead three. See some symmetry in that T wave? Now let's look around the 12 lead. Lead two has a T wave that just shoots right off the QRS complex and it looks and is looking large, so you can consider that hyperacute as well. And you can look at AVF as well. Very small QRS massive T wave. There's there's also minute depression in V1 to V3 indicating there might be some posterior wall infarction going on. So you can see through here. So for a third case, here's a 56 year old female with chest pain. Look at those precordial lead T waves. Especially look in V3. Shooting off the QRS complex is the T wave and that is so big you can fit the whole QRS complex inside of it. Now ER physicians did not recognize this as an occlusion MI, but luckily they did a serial 12 lead. We should be doing serial 12 leads on all of our patients, especially if they're concerning or you're suspicious of some kind of cardiac ischemia going on. We're supposed to be obtaining multiple vitals, right? Well, we should be thinking about the same about 12 leads. 12 leads should be considered another vital sign. And all it costs is just a small tree limb of paper. Now, sometimes when I'm with a patient, I'll do one every eight to 10 minutes and have three or four of them laying across in front of me and I'll be scrutinizing every single one of them. So let's look at that serial 12 lead that they did 15 minutes later. There's now obvious ST elevation. You can see it in V3 and V4 is becoming hyperacute now and there's a little elevation there as well. See? It just takes 15 minutes to elevate to that. So it's really important that we're able to recognize this and bring it to someone's attention. Now to the next one. Now we should be getting the hang of it. Look around, see if you notice anything. Obviously you can see some minor depression in the inferior leads. And you can look over there and you can see hyper Q T waves in the precordial leads of V2 and V3. Very small QRS, jutting off T wave. And it's a lot larger than the QRS, and then this one's also becoming a little hyper acute as well. Now let's look at this one to show you how important serial 12 leads are. The left one shows some hyper acute T waves in V4, right? Just a little bit, jutting right on off, about the same size as the QRS complex, a little bit bigger, right? Other than that, you know, maybe a little bit here in V3, but other than that, not much going around here, right? Now, you do one a couple minutes later, and boom, you got massive elevation, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, and a little bit in V1, and you got a little lateral MI in 1 and AVL, and your depression in 2, 3 AVF. So that is why it's important to do 12 leads. Just wanted to hammer that point home with you guys. We should be pretty much pros by now, right, by the end of this lecture. So what do you guys see? Inferior leads show hypercute T waves, and there's a flip T wave in AVL. Three especially is very hyperacute in nature, shooting right off 
of the QRS complex. It's becoming more symmetric in nature, wide base, massive QR, uh, small QRS, massive T wave, can fit the QRS almost inside of the T wave, and its best friend, late lead AVL, flip T wave. It's going to be an inferior wall MI. This one's very similar to the previous one, hyper QT waves in the inferior leads, and you'll notice some well-formed Q waves in V1 and V2. T waves are also pretty cute. The T waves in some of the precordial leads look like they can be hyper acute in nature, so this could be a type three wraparound LED occlusion. This is what a wraparound LED occlusion looks like on the far right. And that happens when you get some elevation in the precordial leads and it has an LED occlusion and you got in elevation in your inferior leads because it wraps around the bottom. Now this was sent in by a very astute paramedic who was able to recognize an occlusion MI on this chest pain patient. See the flip T wave in AVL? Look at Lee 3, his best friend. QRS is small, T wave isn't too crazy, but it's shoot, uh, sort of shooting out from the QRS complex. She was able to quickly identify the AVL and how it was becoming slightly symmetric in some of the inferior leads. And obviously she noticed the T wave inversions in V2, V3, V4, and a little bit in V5. So she was thinking occlusion MI right off the rip. Now let's see what she does next. She did the right thing and obtained a serial 12 lead. Look at those changes. T waves are hyper acute with reciprocal T wave inversions. She was able to convince the hesitant ER physician to activate the cath lab because of the changes on the serial 12 leads. So this is another example of why we really need to be doing it because the physician was not going to call it based off the second 12 lead or even the first one. It was based off the fact that she had both of them to show that now lead three is developing Q waves and there's more hyper acuteness and there's T wave inversions in AVL. It's because of her ability to recognize this that this patient's ejection fraction was saved. Now let's do a little recap. There are only two big things I want to talk about. Serial 12 leads are a necessity. I can't preface this enough. You can kill a few trees because if that's what it takes to convince a physician to activate the cath lab, then do it. Be a better provider and be a patient advocate. And finally, look for that frowny convex morphology on your hyperacute T waves. The symmetry broad complex. And don't forget about the QRS to T wave proportionality. Medicine's all about baby steps, people. My name is Matt. I hope you guys enjoy this.